Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I know it's raining, but I believe you can do better than that. Good morning, everybody. Come on and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. It's not for me, it's for him. It's for the one you worship. It's for the one you adore. I believe you can stand to your feet on this morning and give God the welcome that he deserves. We're gonna welcome you, but I want you to welcome the spirit of the Lord in this place. Welcome him just because he's good. Welcome him just because he's wonderful. Welcome him just because he's great. Welcome him because he's a Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Welcome him because he reigns forevermore. Come on and welcome him like you mean it, like you're glad to be here. Welcome him like you're a child of the Most High God. Welcome him like you're a saint. Welcome him, welcome him, welcome him, welcome his presence into this place. Come on, welcome him. Come on, warm it up. Welcome him, welcome him, welcome him. He's a mighty good God, a wonderful God, and an awesome God. We love your God on today. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. And it is so great, so wonderful to see you and to greet you on this morning. I hope and I pray that you are not bothered by the weather, whether under cloudy skies or sunny skies or rainy skies, whether the lightning is flashing or the thunder is rolling, whether, as the songwriter puts it, sin's breakers are trying and determined to conquer our souls. We're here because we heard the call and we heard the voice of Jesus telling us to fight on and to pray on and to sing on and to worship on and just to keep on keeping on. And for this reason, God promised that he would never ever leave us alone. And so I welcome you to Hampton University this morning. If you're new, I welcome you to your home by the sea. And if you're returning, welcome back to your home by the sea. God bless you on this morning. And I hope we all have a wonderful, wonderful week. We're prepared and we hope you're ready. God bless you. God bless you and thank you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in. When I think about where the Lord has brought me, where the Lord has brought us from, my soul cries, hallelujah. Is there a witness in the house? The Lord is good. The Lord has been good. We're here today because of his grace and mercy. It is an honor and a privilege to stand and to welcome you back to our homeland by the sea. The 103rd Ministers Conference and the 83rd Choir Directors and Organist Guild Workshop. We're glad that God has been so gracious over the past 12 months and enable us to return the one more time. And so as you're here during this week where you shall receive instruction, inspiration, and uh, encouragement, you're going to be energized by the grace of God. Yesterday we celebrated Pentecost Sunday, the birth of the church. During this week of worship, we're looking for the Choir and Directors Guild to lead us in another rebirth so that when we leave these shores on this week, we're going to be energized by the Spirit and by the grace of God. The Scripture says, let everything, everything, everything that has breath Praise the name of the Lord. Anybody in the house got breath? Can I hear all of you that have breath give praise and glory to God with just a hallelujah shout? I praise him for his excellent goodness. I praise him for his wonderful grace. I praise him for his magnificent mercy. Let everything, everything that has breath give praise. Can I get a hallelujah shout?
Praise the Lord. Let's not stop praising him. Amen. Let's continue to praise God. The Choir Directors Organist Guild is now in session. Amen. We welcome you. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad. How many are glad this morning that the Lord, the Lord has brought you safely through another minister's choir director's organist guild conference this week. We're having a wonderful week. Professor Dickinson and his staff has prepared a wonderful itinerary for you this week. And we pray that you attend every workshop, especially your rehearsals. Please be attentive. We have some seniors here and, and they feel like they're left out. Please be attentive to our seniors. Give them a smile, give them a love, open the door for them, especially the ones on canes and the ones that are in wheelchairs. Love on our seniors this week, amen? Are there any first timers this year? First timers, just stand up. Amen. Person next to them, shake their hand, make them feel welcome. Give them a handshake, make them feel welcome. We just gonna love on everybody this week. Love, love, love. Love on love, amen. Okay, we will have our first timers attendees on Wednesdays ladies and gentlemen, at 12 o'clock at our student center. Along with that, we will be distributing our pens for attendees who have attended the conference for five years and above. And remember, it's increments of five years, 5, 10, 15, 20. Okay, and please be over to the student center on Wednesday. I'd like for Catherine Carver, our assistant secretary, she will be in charge, please stand up, Catherine. In charge of the pins, and please give your name to her, and she will give you a form to fill out. Okay, there will also be a scholarship basket going around on Thursday's rehearsal. Please give liberally to our scholarship fund. Also, there will be a sheet of paper going around for persons or members that, are, that have deceased and all we need is their name, their city, and state so we can recognize them on our Friday communion service. Ladies, just a reminder on concert night, white dresses, white suits, white shoes, pearl earrings, men, white shirts, black pants, black trousers. And on Friday, ladies, black dresses, and black shoes, men, black pants, black, white shirts, black shoes. Amen? Okay, we wanna be in decent in order. That shows how, how much we love each other and how much we're gonna encourage each other. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless you. Good morning. Let's get that hymn book out, your program book, in the back of it. The section called Hymns. And let's stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
Our scripture reading will come from Psalms, the 24th chapter. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of horse. He, he is the king of glory. His word has already been blessed. Good morning. Good morning. I can't hear you. Good morning. Let us prepare to go to the throne of grace, please. Will you bow your heads? Father in heaven, we want to first say thank you. Thank you for bringing us back to Hampton University for a minister's conference and choir director's guild. We thank you, Lord God, for what you're gonna prepare for us. We pray for a special anointing. We pray for your grace, your mercy. Father, we pray that you bless every person that's come Bless them in a special way. Anoint them afresh, Lord God. Bless the directors. Bless the music that's going to be prepared. Bless our speaker this morning in a special way. Be with us. Stand by us. Protect us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Can we collectively just tell the Lord thank you on this morning? Can we tell him thank you on this morning from keeping us from dangers seen and unseen? Come on, we can lift our voices together and simply say to him, say thank you, Lord. When you see that he kept you, you can say thank you. Not that we've been so good, but he's been so kind. So we say, thank you, Lord. And we just want to say, I just want to thank you, Lord. Can we say that again? Come on. Everybody say thank, thank you. Come on and tell, thank you, Lord. God, I thank you for being so good, so I say thank. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Ah, so many reasons to just say thank. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I just, I just, to thank you, Lord. Now can we tell him that he's been so good? 
Come on and say you've been so God, you've been so good. How many know he's been good to you? Oh, you've been so, so good. Come on and tell him that he's been, yeah, so, oh, good. They didn't make it from last year to this year But I want to say you've been So, so good When I look back over my life I realize that you've been Oh God, so You've been so good So I stand here today and I for anybody. Come on and say you made. Hey. Yeah. God, you made a way. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Say you made. Uh, God, you made a way. Uh, God, I know that you made, that you made, you made. Uh, yes, you did. and my sisters and say, I just want to thank you, Lord. Now collectively, one more time, we say thank you, thank you, ah, God, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we say. I got anything to thank him for. Come on, lift your voice and thank. Come on, to thank you. Thank you, Lord. Come on and say, I just want to. I just want to. I just want to. I just. I just want to. Can we say, we just want to? We, we just want to thank. Come on, say, we just, we just want. Can you point at somebody and say, they just want to, they just want to. Now make it personal. I just, I just want to thank you. if you love him only if you love him if he's made a way if he's been good if you got something to thank him for give him praise
the history and mission of the Choir Directors Organist Guild. In 1933, Hampton Institute saw the benefit of establishing a forum for the practical purpose of training and educating musicians in choral technique, hymn singing, and development in choral literature. Because of this forward thinking, the Hampton Ministers Conference would elevate its membership to include church musicians. This action would give those musicians who attend the conference a heightened sense of value add worth. Charles Flax, Mandonia Porter, Wendell Whalum, Effie Gardner, Willis Barnett, Roland Carter, and Donnelly White would all become significant figures in the development of the choir directors and organist guild. The legacy of service and the quality of music that gave to the minister's conference has left an inedible impression on the world of not only African American church music development, but to church music development as a whole. One of the charter members and first president of the guild, Madam Mandonia Porter Owens, set the mission of the guild in very simple yet significant terms. She outlined that the minister's conference should train the church musician as well as the minister to enrich the worship service and inspire musicians to want to dedicate their lives to worship God through their music. The Guild was founded based on this premise and maintains this mission today. An integral, integral to the above mission, the primary purpose of the workshop is the encouragement and improvement of choral singing and organ playing through intensive, intensive dynamic program of instruction and performance. The discussion and rehearsal period to deal with issues such as choral techniques, program building, rehearsal procedures, problems of balance and arrangements, and other subjects related to the daily work of the choir director and church organist musician. The early years saw workshops being presented by Dr. L. W. McCall, Dr. C. L. Jones, Dr. Charles Higgins, the first black worship leader, all from Westminster Choir Schools. The music came from the campus hymnal using the great hymns of the church, chants, and lectures on the great hymn writers. Instruction in church music, organ techniques, and open forms on church problems began to become a focus for the workshop. Each workshop included in a recital hall and recital in Clark Hall, which eventually moved to Ogden Hall and was open not only to guild members, but to the ministers and summer session attendees. After a few years of growth, the newly formed choir of musicians was asked to sing in the opening session of the conference in general. This was described as the spirit of a great revival. The guild was always challenged to keep the integrity, standards, and character of church music high for spiritually it was good in God's eyes. Today the mission, purpose, and focus of the Choir Directors and Organists Guild workshop remain true to its original intent. The co-directors of music have sought to bring some of the best minds and talents together for this conference. The focus on the hymns, spirituals, and anthems speak to the unique history of the guild in preserving these traditions for church worship. The inclusion of gospel music, praise and worship, and contemporary Christian music speaks to the innovation and modern philosophy that many of our churches are constantly challenged. The co-directors strive to achieve a balance of sound teaching, inspirational preaching, a sense of service, and a pantheon of praise which are all paramount importance to all offerings. The officers and music directors want to ensure that the purpose of the workshop is still rooted in high standards, integrity, and a devotion to the will of God through our efforts in church music.
Our preacher today needs no introduction, but in order to fulfill the mandate of programmatic protocol and to give our speaker the honor in which he is so certainly due, hear ye the bio of Dr. Lance D. Watson. Dr. Lance D. Watson is a three-time summa cum laude graduate of Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, from which he holds the Bachelor of Science in Psychology, the ba Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, and the Master of Arts in Guidance and Counseling. He is a magna cum laude graduate of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University, from which he holds a Master of Divinity and a summa cum laude graduate of the Presbyterian School of Christian Education at Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. He completed his doctoral studies at United Theological Seminary, earning the Doctorate of Ministry degree. His achievements and recognitions are noteworthy. He has been honored as an outstanding community leader, outstanding contributor to education, Minister of the Year, as well as an African-American role model by several organizations. He is listed in Who's Who in Religion and a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. For over 30 years, he has served senior pa as senior pastor of the St. Paul's Baptist Church of Richmond, Virginia, and chief visionary for its corporate affiliates. He is the host of the telecast Positive Power, Sing Globally, St. Paul's is progressive and has a progressive pastor with more than 12,000 persons meeting across three locations in three different countries and it supports mission and ministry causes around the globe. A native of Detroit, Michigan, he is married to Rosemary Wilder, a noted and world-traveled singer, producer, and entrepreneur, and together they are the parents of three children and five grandchildren. A gifted communicator, pastor, Ideapreneur, television personality, and cultural architect. He is the author of several books, Maximize Your Edge, Meet Me in the Morning, and That Was Then. This is now all available. You can subscribe free to his weekly podcast at lightsource.com and follow him on social media at I am Lance Watson. I travel, travel along, if I can help somebody with a word or song, if I can help
sound Then my living shall know
Some of y'all just throw your head back and shout hallelujah. Glory to God. We give all praise and honor and glory to God from whom all blessings flow. That last musical offering, more than any program could ever articulate, is a testimony to the power of the 83rd choir director at Organist Gill's ability to enhance church music and give praise to God. Come on, give God praise for her one more time. To President Harvey, President Riddick, to President Dorsey, to Professor Dickerson, Dr. Hagens, to all of the officers of the 103rd Hampton Ministers Conference and the 83rd Choir Director and Organist Guild, to all of you, my brothers and sisters in the faith, God is great and greatly to be praised. And if you believe it, put your hands together and give him a praise. Amen. I am highly honored and greatly privileged to have this opportunity to stand in this sacred space and to greet you in the name of the Lord. It's a joy to be here. And I know that I'm not here because I'm worthy. I'm here because of his grace. Matter of fact, I survive on grace. What about you? I survive on grace. And so I want to thank, I want to thank uh, Professor Dickerson and uh, President Dorsey and all of those who are involved in inviting us to share in this keynote experience. And I want to thank all of you for thinking it not robbery to get up on an early Monday and gather in this place to bless the name of the Lord. Amen. And if you would, take your neighbor by the hand real quick on your left and on your right. Just for a moment, get their hand. Lean over and tell them your first name, not your title, the name your mama gave you. Tell them your first name. As you hold their hand. And now for this person whose name you know and whose hand you hold, would you pray with me? Lord, for the persons that we touch, whose names we know, whose hands we hold, we pray right now. We want to thank you for just keeping them alive. We want to thank you for bringing them through everything they had to come through. We want to thank you that after all they've been through, they still have joy. So we squeeze their hand in agreement that great things are still ahead of them. Breathe on my neighbor. Lift my neighbor. Encourage my neighbor. Bless my neighbor through this experience, and I will give you praise. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah and amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. And there's a word from the Lord that I'd like to share with you on this morning, and I won't be before you long. I've been practicing a new beatitude that goes, blessed are the brief, for they will be invited back. So I want to invite your attention to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16. And I'd like to read in your hearing verses 14 through 23. And I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation, which may read a little bit differently than yours, but at the end of the day, the truth is just the truth. And this is the word of the Lord. Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find you a good musician to play the harp whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. 
He will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. All right, so I'll say, find me someone who plays well and bring him here. One of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war, has good judgment. He is also a fine looking young man and the Lord is with him. And all the people said, amen. amen. I wanna tag that text with the title, Music for a Maniac. Pay attention to the things in your life that don't make sense because it's often in those spaces that God is navigating you to the place that God has prepared for you. In the opening episode of this chapter, David is moving through an experience that makes little sense. The prophet Samuel named and anointed him as the next king of Israel, but he's giving him a position that is already occupied. Therefore, soaked with oil from head to foot, he returns to the sheep pen with a promise hanging over him and a question standing before him. And the question is how? How will he get from there to here? How is God going to get him from the palace or from the pasture to the palace? What will be his opening? What will be his platform? What will be his stage? Because humanly speaking, David has as much of a chance of making it to the throne room as you and I have of going to the Vatican for a barbecue with the Pope. This is a huge question, not just for David, but for any of us and all of us who have a hint of holy greatness stirring in our spirit who sense that where we are is not where we end. How is God going to get us there from here? How is God going to make us the head and when we feel like the tail? How is God going to establish us above when we're so far beneath? How is God going to put us ahead when we're so far behind? We dream of greatness, but for many the dream gets trampled by the hard road of reality. A difficult marriage, overdue bills, uncooperative environments, derisory paychecks, a learning disability, rejection by one's family, a long-term illness, infertility, unemployment, or caring for elderly parents. How will we get there from here? And the scandal of this story is that instead of the oldest, God picked the youngest. Instead of the first, God picks the last. Instead of the obvious, God selects the obscure. Instead of the popular, God picks the forgotten. It doesn't make sense. The draft seems irregular and the vetting mysterious. But this is a demonstration of sovereign grace and a glimmer of holy navigation. What's happening to David is not based on merit or status, but grace. Grace is the gift of God that causes things to happen on the seen from the unseen. P.K. McCarter wrote, it's an exciting moment in scriptural drama when David first steps on the stage. But in my opinion, it's more exciting to see how God ushers him from obscurity to notoriety because the textual narrator gives us three introductions to David. First of all, we meet him as the youngest son in a notable family from backwater Bethlehem. His older brothers were soldiers and standouts. David was the eighth son, the runt of the litter. And in this home of towering sons, he was the smallest and grew up exiled to policing the sheep pen outside the circle of the family and its influence. Because in families, it usually takes the fierce competition of sibling rivalry for a child who resides outside the circle to break through to the inside. 
However, David refused to play the game of self-promotion because out in the fields, he gained a profound sense of the abiding presence of God. It was through his loneliness that he developed a deeper sense of dependency on God. That's how he could later write Psalm 27:10, that when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Because rejection can be a tool in the hands of God to deepen our trust in God. David did not campaign for significance to become a star in Jesse's family. In fact, in the opening scene, if you read it, David never spoke one word. And this is perhaps one of the most outstanding characteristics of David, that throughout his lifetime, he never once sees the crown. If it was his destiny to be great, God would have to do it. And it is God who delights in David. David operating behind the scenes who orchestrates all the action that navigates him eventually to the place of promise and destiny. Through the prophetic word, this exiled teenager was brought in from the sheep pen and placed right in the center of the family circle. Amid his shocked brothers, this unlikely candidate was drenched with anointing oil and duly empowered by God spirit, receiving the only credential essential for kingship. And as this saga unfolds in scripture, the poignant question is how? How will David make his ascent from the pastures of Bethlehem to the palaces of Jerusalem? What will his steps be? And this is insightful for us because please understand, even though it's early on a Monday, that any would-be resident of the palace must first log some time in the pasture. Okay, y'all don't want to hear that. That everybody longs for the palace, but the way to the palace is through the pasture. Okay, I'll make it plain. Everybody want to roll on 22s, but the question is, can you be happy on 46s? See, everybody wants to ride in the limo, but the question is, can you ride with me on the bus? Everybody wants to rock the Louis Vuitton, but the real issue is, can you swing the dollar store with swagger? Because you don't get to the palace overnight. Everybody must do some time in the pasture because in the pasture you learn focus, you learn discipline, you learn humility, and you learn responsibility. In the pasture you discover what it means to truly lean and depend on God. And I know that some of you are in the pasture right now, but I came to tell you today you ain't gonna be there much longer. You've been on the back burner all year, but you're about to come to the front of the stove. And every good cook knows you don't bring a pot to the front of the stove unless you're about to serve it up. See, David returned to the pasture. And the first instrument in God's hand used to get him moving towards the palace was a problem. Everybody shout problem. Now, please don't miss this. It's helpful. God is going to use a problem to set you up for the palace. I hope that after this you see your problems differently because every problem brings with it a possibility. The problem in our text was precipitated by an exit and an entrance. Listen to verse 14. It says, now the spirit of the Lord departed that's the exit, from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him, that's the entrance. The narrator's second introduction takes us to the royal court, and King Saul's administration was in ruins. Every day there was some new story, some new scandal, some new revelation that had leaked out of the palace, and without a smartphone or a Twitter account to keep his mind occupied, his emotions were in chaos. Give me just a minute, because Saul didn't have a bad beginning. 
he enters the scriptural story magnificent, his stature compelling, his humility endearing, everything about him was promising. In fact, the honor of being king did not go to Saul's head. It did not mean for him privilege or exemption from work or extensive vacations to Mar-a-Lago. He continued to work his farm. He was a great general, achieving victory after victory, and generally a good person, gracious in his exercise of power. Yet, it's not long before we began to pick up indications that Saul, for all of his charisma and charm, wasn't that interested in God. He was more interested in his work than he was in his worship. And that's where he stepped out of bounds because none of his acts of, of disobedience were immoral or unjust. In fact, both were dictated by good military strategy, but both were in direct violation to the instructions God had explicitly given. Saul was ruined as an anointed king in the course of doing an appointed work. His ability to do the work was evidence of his anointing. Because in sacred text, being anointed means you've been given a job by God. It is fundamentally employment. There's a job for you to do and you're assigned to do it and you can do it because you've been anointed for it. Anointing is the sacramental connection or linking our work with the work of God. But it's not enough just to do the work. We've got to do the work God's way. And over time, it became obvious that Saul saw God as a resource and not as the source. And God will not be manipulated by anybody at any time. Whereas the Spirit of God was imparted to David, it departed from Saul and into that spiritual vacuum. An evil spirit from the Lord tormented Saul. Saul is overwhelmed and terrified with symptoms that resemble those of a manic depressant. He was driven by insane rage in one moment and by deep depression in the next. Saul had begun to go crazy. Can I break it down? He had begun to lose his mind. Can I break it down? He was going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He had become a maniac, not simply because an evil spirit had entered, but because the spirit of God had exited. Come here for a moment, because notice that the narrator makes it clear that this spirit is from the Lord and not of the Lord. Though the idea that God was the source of Saul's stress may trouble us, we should take comfort in the reality that because God is sovereign, this spirit, along with all of creation, is subject to God, under God's control, and and ultimately serves God's purpose. Saul's tortured state was the direct consequence of his disobedience. And as we open the New Testament, we find the nation of Israel in the same condition. Injustice, oppression, and cruelty reign. But whenever the Son of God showed up, they cowered in fear, knowing that they were subject to the authority of Christ. And similarly, my brothers and sisters, I want to remind you that Christ has empowered all of us with that self-same ability. We have been given authority to critique and change the malicious march of mass incarceration, the persistence of poverty across the country, the war on drugs, state-sponsored violence, the destruction of the environment, failing school systems, homophobia, sexism, patriarchy, fake news, and alternative facts. We are supposed to be telling the devil what bus to catch and what stop to get off at. Saul's problem was precipitated by an exit and an entrance because whenever God withdraws his presence, the result is torment, depression, and misery. God ain't got to do nothing to you. All God's got to do is walk away from you. 
and you will tear up your own life. Saul's deplorable condition is obvious to everybody but Saul. Don't miss that. He was still holding the seat, not knowing he had already been fired. Having turned his back on the Lord, he is no longer able to see reality. But his spiritual blindness is no impediment to God, for God has untold servants who can see what the king fails to see. Like a unified chorus, not a disorganized cabinet, Saul's servants give the correct diagnosis of Saul's malady, and they politely propose a a solution. Tell him to stop tweeting in the middle of the night. Oh, I'm sorry, that's somebody else. But everybody recognizes that something must be done. So on the tail end of this problem, somebody offers a prescription. You know, it's characteristic that when people in power go bad, the fact is hidden from the public at first. There may be leaks with only the inner circle knowing that something is dreadfully wrong. But knowing that something must be done, a desperate search begins for an amicable solution. And notice the suggestion in verses 15 and 16. Saul's servants are insightful. They say, let us get you a musician. That's excellent advice, perhaps sensing as William Congrave in The Morning Bride of 1697 would later say that music has charms to soothe the savage beast. Saul's attendants offer a proposal that send them to find a musician who can play with skill. The proposal comes with a promise that whenever the evil spirit descends upon Saul, the melodious strings of this as yet unknown musician would soothe Saul's psychosis and calm his troubled mind. It has been suggested that the entire field of music therapy is based on the premise of this text. It has roots in the entertainers who played for wounded warriors in World War II because they found that music helped the soldiers recover faster. Because all of us today, as we began this 83rd convocation of choir directors and organists and church musicians, have to acknowledge that there is something about music that soothes, comforts, and ministers to us no matter what's going on in us or around us. Have I got any witnesses here? That music can soothe the troubled waters that are raging in your life. Just think about how you feel when somebody sings, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me. Music can soothe us, but music can stir us. Just think about how you feel when a choir stands up and begins to sing, all hail the power of Jesus name let angels prostrate fall God soothes us stirs us and God speaks to us through the wings of music God uses music to revive our spirit have you ever been secretly depressed I know we can't admit it out loud because we become so artificial and phony in our practice of faith that you cannot be openly depressed in the church anymore you have to be secretly depressed how are you I'm blessed and highly favored then you get in the car and oh I feel like giving up that's secret depression but God uses music to revive us pick us up and give us new life don't you remember that was the function of the blues the sacred blues and the secular blues parenthetically when we used to sing the blues as African American people we didn't kill each other widespread and we were not killing ourselves like talking about it but when we knew how to sing the blues a brother would lose his woman and she left for another man he didn't go looking for a gun he sat down by the radio and started singing, I'm going down to the railroad. 
I lay my fool head on the track. But then he had sense enough to sing. And when that train comes, I'm gonna pull my fool head back. See, we had secular blues and we had sacred blues. We sang secular blues on Friday, but then we sang sacred blues on Sunday. I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain or victory is mine. I told Satan to get thee behind cause victory is mine. They said, let us get you a musician. How does God get his unknown servant into the royal court? God uses a problem for which his servant is the prescription. It's the problem that gained David access to the palace. It's the problem that created a need for his skills in that environment. Don't ever forget that God can use the negative to create the positive because this problem set the stage for the emerging possibility. The adversity might just be creating an atmosphere for your future advance because God anoints us in trouble, not from trouble. David was so gifted that his presence changed the atmosphere. Saul had a problem. David was the prescription. And I wish I had a lot of time because I need to tell some musician here that you are the prescription, that you need to find your problem because in finding your problem, you will discover your purpose, that God is navigating a situation right now for which you are the solution. You have what somebody else needs. You're the cure for somebody's affliction. You're the solution for somebody's problem. There's somebody in some church somewhere who needs exactly what you got. Somebody needs your skills. They need your ability, your intelligence. They need your personality, your charm, your smile, your story, and your song. Somebody needs your sense of humor, your testimony, your voice, your prayer, your vision, and your faith. You are the missing piece to somebody's puzzle. You are the missing element in somebody's equation. You are the missing character in somebody's story. Your differences are really distinctions that make you unique and make you valuable. You are the proscription for somebody's trouble. I dare you to tap your neighbor like you believe it and say you don't even know who you sit next to. I'm the prescription for somebody. I might not be your prescription, but I'm healing for somebody. I'm deliverance for somebody. I'm comfort for somebody. I'm help for somebody. And that's why at this stage of my life, I no longer go where I'm tolerated. I only go where I'm appreciated because I know I am a gift to somebody see David David responds to a problem because he is the prescription so he becomes God's person the king accepted their promising proposal but a person had to be sought and the text says that person had to be skilled Proverbs twenty two thirty nine 39 raises the question do you see someone skilled at their work that person will stand before kings the question is never the opportunity it is always the preparation that God will make sure that you get the opportunity but you have to be prepared to take advantage of it. This young man remitted David's resume and detailed the list of impressive qualifications in six word pairs that are so astonishing they leave no room for alternatives. Saul was searching for a paramedic and his servant found a neurosurgeon. He appears overqualified for the job, but since we know how the story unfolds, we understand that there's something happening in between the lines because God is always working in between the lines of your life. His portfolio is prophetic and it points to his purpose because this is how God sees David and by implication how God sees us. God reshuffles the deck 
so that Saul, blind to the ways of providence, is forced to pick up the one card that God has already chosen. David has to compose songs in the threatening presence of a maniac. But when he played, the music soothed his savagery. David's skill is extraordinary and will one day earn him the title, the sweet singer of Israel. But as we discover in chapter 17, David brings more to the plate than just his musical skills. He was multifaceted. He was he could multitask. And I want to tell somebody the next level of your life is going to require you to be able to do more than just one thing. You're going to have to do a whole lot of things in order to meet this next level because militarily he was praised for his bravery. He was articulate. Add to that. David's physical appeal. He had a smile like Denzel. He had a swagger like Morris Chestnut. He had the appeal of Terrence Howard. And he licked his lips like LL Cool J. And you began to grasp the tremendous magnetism that David possessed. He is the ultimate renaissance man. He is musical, rugged, articulate, and attractive. Your gifts will make room for you. And if your gifts have not made room for you, it could be you ain't operating in your gifts. Your gifts will make room for you, but you've got to work your gifts because nobody has everything, but everybody has something. So if you've got a trumpet, blow it. If you've got a piano, play it. If you've got a drum, beat it. If you can cook, bake it, brawl it, fry it, grill it, saute it, or fricassee it. If you can clean, wash it, rinse it, or shout it out. If you can talk, say it. If you can sing, hit that note. If you can fight, throw that punch. If you can administrate, organize it. If you can drive, turn it, push it, or press it. If you can play ball, pass it, catch it, throw it, hit it, dunk it, dribble it, or bounce it. If you can do hair, fry it, dye it, cut it, curl it, braid it, comb it, press it, weave it. But whatever God has given you, you got to do it, do it, do it till you're satisfied, whatever it is. David worked his gift. And the Bible says the Lord was with him. That's the pivot and turning point of this scene. The Lord was with him so he could soothe Saul's psychosis. The Lord was with him so he could sidestep the landmines. The Lord was with him so his ascension to the throne was guaranteed. Saul's unrelenting pain made him eager to skip the lengthy process of a nationwide search. Saul took the bait and gave the executive order asking Jesse to send his son. Stop trying to get appointed when you have already been anointed. You got to get that because God was moving his person into position. If we desire God to use us on a holy stage, we must never forget that the primary quality that commends us to others is not our authority or our supremacy, but our humility. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and in due season, God will exalt you because wherever you are, whether it's a mega church or a storefront, God has put you there to serve. The servant in this story was simultaneously the sovereign. He was called to rule and how does he do it? by serving and as a person of faith as a child of God ruling is what we do but serving is how we do it God positioned him to serve because it was his service in the present that set him up to succeed in the future Saul was pleased with a solution the divine medicine worked the temp job was made permanent Saul was so taken by David that he immediately made him a part of of his inner circle. This new position in the royal court gave David intimate access to the king at all times. The proposal of this unnamed servant was adopted and works to perfection. Hear me well today. This is going to be countercultural to what you hear in the world. You don't have to build 
your own stage. David contributes nothing to his exaltation from the pastor to the palace. Instead, behind the scenes is the constant, resolute, sovereign movings of our God. God selects the king of his choice. God then uses the most unlikely instrument to maneuver him onto the stage of prominence. An evil spirit creates a problem. Unnamed servants propose the prescription and identify the person. And an arrogant, agitated king issues the executive order. David accepts the invitation to serve on God's stage. And as a result, God moves him in the position to serve in the present and succeed in the future. You don't have to build your own stage. Just be faithful wherever God puts you. David had no desire to be king. That's God's idea. He had no desire to play his instruments for Saul. That's Saul's idea. He was faithful on the hillside, strumming away under the stars, learning how to make lyrics and music go together. He doesn't have a career path because being a shepherd is not an upwardly mobile profession. And yet behind the scenes, God has arranged to bring David to Saul's court, something that never could have happened without divine intervention. He played music for a maniac. Well, what are you trying to say, Lance? I'm trying to say God will look out for you. God will take care of you. God will guide your steps from beginning to end. God knows where you started and God knows where you're in. And God is able to arrange even the details of your life to make sure that you get there. I hear you, Lance, but you don't know my circumstance. Well, I do know this, that God works in circumstances that are less than ideal. Can I ask you a quick question? I know it's early in the morning, but let's be honest with each other. By a show of hands, how many of you like to eat chicken? Just wave at me. Just wave at me. If you're a preacher and you ain't waving your hands, your credentials are suspect. How many of you like to eat chicken? I could tell from looking at y'all that this is a chicken eating crowd. And I bet that you like all kinds of chicken. You like fried chicken. You like baked chicken. You like grilled chicken. You like chicken and rice. You like chicken and dumplings. You like jerk chicken and barbecue chicken and rotisserie chicken. And when you're done with the rotisserie chicken, I bet you take the scraps and make you some chicken salad. But here's the problem. Some people don't know how to eat chicken. My on in the ministry. Dr. Larry Ennis helped me with this. He said to us, when you eat chicken, you don't leave no meat on the bone. What's wrong with you? You never waste a good chicken wing because that's just disrespectful to the chicken that died to give you life. You're supposed to chew on the bone and suck on the bone. And if it's baked chicken, you dip it in the juice and let it swim around a little bit. You don't waste a perfectly good chicken wing and just as you don't waste chicken, so God will not waste anything that has happened in your life. God works in circumstances that are less than ideal. God can get something out of everything and use anything to do everything. He can work in every mistake, every setback, every failure, every fear, every separation, every long night, every dark day, every wrong turn. God can get something out of everything because God is always at work in your life. Right now, he's shaping you. Right now, he's molding you. Right now, he's making you. Right now, he's teaching you, training you, stretching you, growing you, blessing you. All things are working together for your good because he's intentional. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing is wasted. Not even making music for a maniac. So as you wait for your stage, he that begun this good work in you 
is able to complete it because God did it in David. God did it in Jesus and God will do it in you. God is with you, my friends. So as you live in the tension between your anointing and your ascension, I want to encourage you in closing to choose your instruments wisely because Saul had spears, but David had praise and it was praise that David used to conquer the demons of darkness. Through praise, David outlasted the swords of the range potentates. Through praise, David survived the long wilderness of Ziglag. Through praise, God ordered his steps and sustained his heart. Praise was his greatest legacy. Praise was his strongest instrument. And I've got news for somebody today. Praise will produce a harvest that you didn't work for. Praise will get you a job for which you are not qualified. Praise will give you a life that you don't merit. A raise that you didn't expect. A house that you didn't qualify for. Because I heard somebody say the other day, when the praises of God are going up, the blessings come down. Praise is your instrument. So as you study this week, don't forget there's power in your praise. Power to defeat the enemy. Power to overcome temptation. Power to walk upright. Power to pray effectively. Rejoice triumphantly. Survive successfully. Power to tell your story. Face your burdens and carry your cross. Power to reach your goal. Dispel your doubt. Climb your mountain. Meet your opposition. Stand up to your trials and get your victory. And I don't know how you feel about it. I know it's a Monday, but I feel like it's a Sunday because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul, even on a Monday, my soul cries hallelujah. Have I got a witness? Is there anybody here who can save for yourself? God's been good to me. Then throw your head back and testify to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, if I die tonight, I want somebody to know God is a good God. Feeds me when I'm hungry, clothes me when I'm naked, fights my battles, lifts my head. Can I say it like I want to? Ain't he all right? Say yeah! look to the Lord for the benediction and now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us without fault before his throne with exceeding and overwhelming joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now henceforth and forevermore and as always God over your people let your love your joy and your peace your power your protection and your constant provision your Holy Spirit your holy anointing and your holy presence that gives us so much joy. Father, let it rest, let it rule, and let it abide in the lives of these, your precious believers. In the name of the Christ, we pray, amen, and have a blessed week, everybody.